we've seen the advantages that tradable permits have in terms of efficiency. So the next uh, topic is what kind of problems might tradable permits entail. And the first problem we're going to talk about is called hotspots. Let's suppose that the Environmental Protection Agency decides that the optimal amount of mercury pollution for the lower 48 states of the United States is something like 100 tons. And it decides to set up a tradable permit scheme in order to achieve that 100 ton goal. So the permits are sold throughout the entire US or distributed in some kind of way. But it turns out that gold mining operations are pretty profitable most of the time, not all the time, and emit lots of mercury. And many of them are concentrated in northern Nevada. So what if in these nationwide auctions, almost all the mercury emissions permits were purchased or grandfathered and distributed for free to firms located in northern Nevada? Then while the amount of mercury that they emit is socially optimal if it were to be emitted evenly across the entire United States. If it's only emitted in one small part of the US, then you get a high concentration of the pollutant, which might be way more than what's socially optimal for that particular place. And by the way, if you have mercury emissions in northern Nevada, the winds are going to carry them to the next biggest metropolitan area, which is Salt Lake City. This term hotspot it describes a concentrated amount of pollution in one place. It originally came from an area that had a lot of radioactivity, but now its hotspot doesn't necessarily mean radioactive pollution, just any kind of pollution that's highly concentrated in one spot. Well, clearly this isn't a good thing. It's not socially optimal to have an appropriate amount of mercury for the whole U.S. being emitted in just in one place. So what's the cure for this? The cure for a hotspot would be to break up the U.S. into, let's say, four different regions or 10 different regions or 50 different regions, and then figure out the optimal amount of mercury emissions for each region. And that way you can't have the entire country's mercury emissions occurring in just one place. So that's the first problem, the hotspot. The second potential problem is monopoly power. This isn't a worry if there are only if there are lots of polluters, but if there are only a few polluters in the industry, then they're the ones that control the supply and in some sense the uh, demand as well for pollution permits. And so the pollution permit market is not going to be a competitive market. Uh, for example, if, um, if you have monopoly power, then the price of the permits will be higher than the perfectly competitive price would be. And that's a potential problem. The next topic is barriers to entry. And barriers to entry is actually related to monopoly power. Suppose there's an industry composed of five firms, so not very many. And they're the only polluters of this particular kind of pollutant because they're the only people in this industry. And then a new firm decides they want to come in and be a competitor to the incumbent firms in this industry. So they go out to one of the firms and say, hi, I want to be your new competitor. I'd like to buy some of your permits, please. Clearly what could happen in this imperfectly competitive market is that the firm says, no, it's not going to sell any, regardless of the price. Perhaps even the firms, the, the incumbent firms collude with each other to make sure that none of them are going to sell any permits to to this newcomer. Clearly, that's an anti-competitive use of the market. 
how could you cure this problem with barriers to entry? One way to cure it is to make sure that there are not a small number of polluters, but a large number of polluters uh, that, that have permits. And the way to do that is by expanding the geographical scope of the tradable permit scheme. So number four here, the problems with the cures. Well, the problem with the, the cure with problem number two and three was to expand the geographical scope so you don't have only a small number of polluters in the marketable permit region. But remember, if you will, that the cure for the hot spot was to shrink the geographical area of the relevant tradable permit market so that uh, you can't get a uh, hotspot developing. So in other words, the cure for two and three is to make the geographical area large and the cure to number one is to make the geographical area small. And clearly th there's a contradiction between those, which means that when you make one of these problems better, you run the risk of making the other problem worse. I now like to turn to uh, history of U.S. policies. These are U.S. policies before tradable permit schemes were ever introduced into the real world. These are, in some sense, primitive prototypes of tradable permit schemes. They started in the 1970s, and the first one here is uh, netting you allow one firm to trade new sources of pollution for old sources of pollution. So it's kind of like a cap on one firm. So it's like a tradable permit scheme within one firm. The next one here, offsets, this is like netting for more than one firm. Now, these aren't tradable permit schemes in the sense that you have a permit and there's a money price that changes hands. Instead, the regulator keeps track of how many tons of pollution is occurring and allows uh, trade-offs, either number one, within a firm, and number two, between more than one firm. Number three, so this came after, first came netting, then came offsets, then came bubbles, which is a quota, like a cap, where there isn't a distinction between old sources of pollution and new sources of pollution. And finally is banking, which as I wrote here, is an intertemporal bubble. So you can trade off pollution this year with pollution next year. So that's a brief introduction to the kinds of pre-tradable permit schemes which regulators came up with to try to make the old command and control system more, uh, more flexible.